In yesterday's video, we uncovered the secrets of the glow. With those secrets, we were able to piece together most of the plot of the story. We learned that the pre-war American government was developing a virus called the Forced Evolutionary Virus. It started as an attempt to make Americans immune to Chinese biological weapons, but turned into something much more sinister. A virus that could turn people into superhumans. However, we learned that it had some side effects. The major one being that anyone injected with FEV, but who also has DNA corrupted by radiation, which is everyone in post-war America, will get physically stronger, but they'll lose their memories and become intellectually infantile. This evidence told us that the master, whomever he is, was likely using FEV to create the super mutants. And most importantly, we learned the name of the lab that he's likely using to create his super mutant army, the Mariposa military base. Now, after collecting a Brotherhood of Steel artifact in the glow, we can head back to Lost Hills to share with them what we know and see if they can point us towards the Mariposa military base. When we arrive, we can check in with Cabot. Hey, you're back. Did you get something? Yep, sure did. Great. But, um, the High Elder said you have to give it to me before I can let you in. Sorry. No, I don't want to. Well, let me know when you do. All right, all right, here you go. This is great. Hang on while I open the door. Cabot then walks over and unlocks the door. We could have unlocked this ourselves, but had we done so, he would have immediately turned hostile, and it would have taken an impressive stealth skill to do so undetected. Before heading down, we can ask him a few final questions. Hey, Cabot, have you heard any good rumors lately? Well, some of the initiates think we're preparing for war. That's why hardly anyone gets in now. I was surprised when the High Elder told me to let you in. Why? Well, uh, I don't know, but uh, I've heard the High Elder arguing with the other Elders. Okay. Well, what do you do, Cabot? I greet people at the gates and decide whether to let them in. You and the merchants are about the only ones that get in now, because the Elders seem like they're preparing for something. Why do you let the merchants in? Why do I let them in? Well, we have to get our food and other things. We trade our weapons for all that. Why don't you just grow food yourselves? Uh, well, the purpose of this place is to make scribes and knights. Anyone who wants to be something else just leaves. After thanking Cabot for his time, we can head to the elevator and take it down one floor to the top floor of the Lost Hills Bunker. As soon as we arrive, the initiate guards give us a friendly warning. The Brotherhood might be offended if a stranger, I mean, a new initiate, approaches them with a weapon. So storing our weapons for now, we can talk with the guard. She says, good day, initiate, how may I help you? And the first option we have is to say, hey there, legs, you are looking mighty fine. What time should I pick you up? Uh, because that's how men flirt. If we pass a charisma check, she says, well, you are cute, but I don't think so. I don't think it would be a good idea to get involved with an outsider anyways. But you are cute though, and somewhat attractive. She then changes her mind and says, I don't know if it's because you're an outsider or because of your extreme lack of tact. So, honey, is there anything I can do for you? Um, and with that, I guess we have a girlfriend now? Thanks, Interplay. Well, we can take advantage of how sweet she is on us to try and get some information. We can ask her who's in charge around here, and she says that the High Elder is in charge and his name is Maxon. We can find him on the fourth floor. If we want better weaponry, she says, we should talk to a man named Talus. During the day, we can find him supervising the training hall, which is on this floor right around the corner. When we ask if we could get some training there, she says, Well, yes, you are a member of the Brotherhood after all, but the Elders have put a hold on all training of new initiates. She explains by saying that there are rumors about some kind of army. The Elders want to concentrate their resources on the ones that are already far enough along in their training to make a difference if the Brotherhood finds themselves with a big battle on their hands. The Brotherhood believes that training a small number of fighters extremely well is better than giving mediocre training to a bunch of fighters. Saving lives, after all, is one of their primary objectives. That said, we are always welcome to observe the training. 
Brother Thomas is the one training the troops right now, and he's the best trainer they've ever had at the Brotherhood. If we try to argue our case and say that we are putting our own lives on the line every single day out in the wasteland, she simply says, you know, that may be true, but I'm just telling you what I was told. She's not the right one to argue with. We should talk with Thomas or Talus. Upon ending the conversation with our new girlfriend, the other guard says, I wish I was training right now. This guard duty is a waste of time. Which would only make sense if the Brotherhood never got attacked, but we learn later that they often get attacked which would mean that he's on the front line. Not sure why he's complaining. Heading south down the hallway, we come to a four-way junction. We see an elevator off to the left. We'll skip that for now. There's a computer monitor against the pillar in the middle of this junction. But even when using our science skill, we don't learn anything. We'll turn east for now. At the end of this hallway, we find two power armor wearing Brotherhood Paladins guarding the entrance to a supply room. And behind a table is a soldier in a full suit of combat armor. This is Brother Michael. Hello, brother, he says. How can I help you? Michael here doesn't do anything quite as glorious as a paladin, but his job is important and necessary. He runs the supply room, checking equipment in and out to other people. Now that we're an initiate, we can ask if we can check something out, but Michael says that we have to have the proper authorization. Only specific people can give authorization to check out items from the supply room. He says that to check out supplies, we need to talk with Talus and maybe even Mathia. Mathia is High Elder Maxon's assistant. We find her on the fourth floor, but even though she's technically Maxon's assistant, she works with all of the other elders as well. Talus, however, is close by. Michael says that we can find him in the training room immediately to his left. Moving south, we can open a big round door into the training room, and sure enough, we find a paladin in power armor overseeing a bunch of soldiers training in combat armor. This is Paladin Talus. We can ask Talus more about how the Brotherhood is structured as an organization. The leader of the Brotherhood right now is High Elder Maxon, but it's a council of elders that includes Maxon that makes all major decisions for the Brotherhood. But since there are only four elders, the High Elder's role is to arbitrate a decision in cases of a tie. He then tells us more about himself. Paladin Talus here is the right-hand man to the senior paladin here at Lost Hills, Paladin Rhombus. He and Rhombus are in charge of the paladins and the knights. He's overseeing their training exercise, getting them ready for anything. When we ask him to clarify, he says... Well, there are rumors of a large force moving around in the mountains and desert. With the missing caravans and these rumors, we're just playing it safe. Now, we heard that he's the man we need to talk with to get new weapons and equipment. When we ask him, he says, hold on there, pump those brakes. You're in a hurry, aren't you? As an initiate, you're entitled to a few things. He then puts in a clearance for some combat armor and ammunition of our choice. We just need to check in with Michael to pick up the supplies. That's great and all, but what about some high-tech weapons? He says, I don't know. You may have proven yourself to be an initiate by going to a place where no other paladin has ever been and retrieving an ancient artifact that no one was ever able to retrieve, but that doesn't mean they're gonna start handing over weapons to someone that might not be qualified, especially to an outsider. Uh, no offense. We can press him on this and say, hey, look, I really need some better firepower. And he says, all right, you've built up quite a reputation for yourself. The people I've checked with hold you in high regard. And then he says that he doesn't think we need any help. After all, we survived the glow with the equipment that we had. However, he says, if you help me with one more little problem, he might be able to reward us with something. When we ask him to tell us what the problem is, he says that he sent one of their initiates out to the hub a short while back, and they haven't heard from him since. If we can find out what happened to him, they'd be very grateful. So the Brotherhood lost an initiate at the hub? But we turned the hub upside down. We never found a Brotherhood initiate. We'll have to think about this for a bit. We'll tell him that we'll check it out, and he says thank you. If we find the initiate, and if we rescue him, Talos will remember what we've done, and when we have enough experience, he may be able to give us something special. Looks like we need to head back to the hub, but before we do, let's finish exploring this bunker. There is an unmarked quest here. If we walk into the room, Paladin Thomas, in a full suit of combat armor, begins training the initiates in melee and unarmed combat. We are rewarded if we watch an entire training session. 
Okay, children, today we will be going over some martial arts. In close combat, the technique you use depends on your opponent's size, reach, and quickness. If given the opportunity, test your opponent. Don't rush the attack. All right, my little one, try to hurt poor old grandpa. The initiate tries to strike the teacher, but the teacher dodges. You see how he lost his balance, he says? Overextending yourself leaves you open for a counterattack. When you attack, be sure not to overextend. The initiate asks why overextending is so bad. If you have the opportunity for a kill, shouldn't you go for it, reasons the initiate. That's a lot to risk your life over, says the trainer. Overextending leaves your inside vulnerable to a counterattack and puts you off balance. One little shove will send you right to the ground. Okay, let's give another young punk a try at Gramps. With that, a new soldier walks forward and begins to take swings at the trainer. Let's see if you've learned from the previous example, he says. And after a while, he says, not bad. That last move almost got me. Are you sure you want to be a scribe initiate? Oh, so they also train scribes in melee combat? Those talents would be a shame to waste. You may want to reconsider a career as a knight. Just think about it. I hope you noticed how Brother Anthony did not overextend himself, Thomas says. He also tried to use my weight and bulkiness against me. And that completes the training session. We earn 500 experience points and improves our unarmed and melee skills by 5% each. When done watching the training, we can leave and talk with Brother Michael. We can tell him that we have some supplies to pick up. He says, all right, let me see here. And he checks his requisition form. Ah, yes, he says you do have authorization to check something out. With that, he gives us a menu of ammunition to choose from. And this is repeatable. Once a week, we can come back to Michael and choose some more ammunition. He also gives us a Brotherhood of Steel issue suit of combat armor. This suit of Brotherhood combat armor is slightly better than the suit we got in the glow. They share the same armor class, but the Brotherhood suit has greater resistances. It's overall a better suit. So, we'll put this on, and since companions can't wear armor, we'll go ahead and sell the suit we have. We do see a door to the north, but when we try to open it, the guards stop us. Only scribes and paladins are allowed in this room. We are an initiate. We are neither a scribe nor a paladin. Will we ever be able to explore that room? Maybe we'll have to come back later. For now, we can head southwest down the hallway, and then turn south. At the end of this hallway, we find our room to the west, and this appears to be a barracks. We see a bunk bed, a couple of lockers, and a bathroom, but there's nothing in the lockers. So heading out, we can move west. We see a door immediately to the south, and inside, we find Paladin Rhombus. May I help you? Look at you. You don't look like much of a fighter. Insolent pup! Apologize now, and you'll not be hurt. Hurt? What? By you? You are a disgrace to the Brotherhood. I will teach you manners. And with that, he opens fire. And all of the soldiers here begin to attack. All right, so taunting this guy was not the wisest idea. Reloading a previous save. Instead of taunting him, let's be courteous. We can start a conversation by saying, Can you give me some history about the Brotherhood of Steel? Talk to Vree in the main library. All right, we'll try to find Vree, but how about rumors? Have you heard any good ones? I do not put stock in rumors. Oh man, this guy is all personality. Well, what can you tell me about the surrounding area? The hub and the boneyard are south, mountains are east, and desolate wasteland north. Whoever goes there never returns. Okay, remind me never to go north. Tell me about yourself, Rhombus. I am Rhombus, head of the Paladins. I train those willing to learn. What do paladins do? The scribes copy the plans for the weapons and the knights make them. The paladins protect the brotherhood from harm. Huh. So scribes come up with blueprints for weapons, knights make the weapons, and paladins serve as soldiers. The job descriptions for the different Brotherhood ranks appear to change from chapter to chapter. I don't recall seeing any knights on the East Coast forging weapons. Well, Rhombus, what kind of harm do the Paladins protect the Brotherhood from? Many covet our technology. We have at least four attacks a week, from raiders to just people who want to steal what we have. Sounds like some pretty dumb raiders and scavengers. Well, hey, Rhombus, since you train Paladins, can you teach me some stuff? Stuff. I could teach you how to fight, 
if you had any ability. But the High Elder decreed no training of new recruits until the threat of invasion passes. What threat is that? It is not my place to answer. See the High Elder if you wish. Oh, come on. Please? No. Pretty please? Do you not hear? I will not say it again. <laughs> and with that, he stops talking with us. If we try to talk with him again... I will waste no more time with you. No nonsense kind of guy. But he's lying here. Even after we remove the threat of invasion later in the game, when we come back, we never find an option for Rhombus to train us to become a paladin. Which means we never have an opportunity to explore what's behind this door as a scribe or a paladin. I suppose we could always try to sneak in, but even late at night there are plenty of guards outside the door. I tried using a stealth boy, and no matter what I did, as soon as I succeed at unlocking this door, all members of the Brotherhood of Steel turn hostile. This is effectively committing suicide earlier in the game, but later in the game, it is possible to survive this attack. If we stand in this doorway, the Brotherhood Paladins like to walk right up to us and then form a line. The thing is, they all use Gatling lasers and miniguns. So if we have enough stim packs or super stim packs to top us up before each battle, we can effectively stand here while the Paladins kill each other with burst damage while trying to shoot at us. They'll fire at me, I'll take two or three damage, they blow the head off of one of the other paladins. Another paladin moves up to stand on top of his corpse, and he too gets mowed down by a gambling laser. In this way, by standing in this one spot, I was able to wipe out the entire floor. Our reward for doing so is being able to loot this supply closet. These boxes littering the room are containers. However, it's a little deceptive. Each stack of boxes is a container. So one box on the ground is only one container, but a stack of three boxes also functions as only one container. If we choose to go this route, we can load up with endgame weaponry and supplies. I found a crate full of stim packs, a crate with a minigun, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, a crate with electronics including five stealth boys, one filled with chems, 11 first aid kits, 11 radway, and 18 sticks of dynamite, a gatling laser with over a thousand rounds of microfusion cells, though after killing all of these paladins we can walk away with a couple dozen and Gatling lasers, a crate with nearly 20 plasma grenades, flamer fuel, and a full set of T-51 power armor. I'll go over this in a bit. Pulse grenades, a plasma rifle, a flamer, a missile launcher with explosive missiles, and a completely unique item, the technical manual. If we inspect the technical manual in our Pip-Boy, we learn that this is a technical repair manual for the T-51B power armor suit. However, it has no use in game. We can't read it, we can't use it, we could sell it for around 200 caps, but really it's just a collector's item for players who want to collect everything in the game. Finishing off the supply room, we find a sniper rifle, more super stim packs, and cattle prods, which is a decent mid-game weapon. And then we find another suit of T-51B power armor. There's a box filled with mid-game weapons, and another filled with a stack of books, Dean's Electronics, First Aid Manuals, Electric Lock Picks, Scout Handbooks, and Big Books of Science. Early game armor, some supplies, including 13 coils of rope, completely unnecessary, but valuable for resale, I suppose. A shotgun with shells and seven rippers. Heading east, we find two final boxes, but both are empty. In the tiny room here, we find a bunch of computer equipment, but we can't interact with it in any way. So yeah, killing the Brotherhood and looting this supply closet is very rewarding, but I'd hate to lose the Brotherhood in my game. So reverting to a previous save, we can bypass the supply closet for now and instead head down the western hallway. Here we find an elevator that can take us all the way to floor number four, but we'll start by heading to floor number two. On floor two, we can head east. We find a computer room with a whole bunch of scribes. The scribes have canned dialogue. Did you know that the hydrogen atom is 99.9843425x empty space? And knowledge is power. I'll be a paladin someday. I've seen a spaceship before. 
This must be a classroom for scribes. We see the teacher at the head of the class who says, I'm sorry, but I can't talk right now. I have a class to run. Heading out of this room, we can explore the rooms to the east. These are the Brotherhood Barracks, and the doors are locked. However, we can pick them without getting in trouble. The brothers will say things like, I think you're in Jerry's room, and this isn't your room, please leave. But they don't attack. We can loot all of the lockers and all of the footlockers as much as we want, and we do find stuff, though it's primarily 44 Magnum rounds. In the room furthest to the north, we find our bunk room. This is the only one not locked. And here we find Jerry. Hi there, you must be Brother Oxhorn, the new initiate from the outside. My name is Jerry. I'm your new roommate. I'm an initiate too. I've been studying so hard. Are you an initiate knight or an initiate scribe? If we tell him that we're a knight, he says that that's what he wants to become too. If we say that we want to be a scribe, he says that he thinks learning is important. If we say that we haven't decided yet, he says, yeah, I'm still trying to decide too. But no matter what we decide, he says, by the way, if you want the top bunk, just let me know. I don't mind. Then for some reason, he suggests that we go see a doctor. Every time we enter the room, he says, hi again. And yeah, there you go. That's Jerry. After looting the containers in this room, we can move to the room to the northwest. Here we find the doctor. The doctor can heal us and cure our radiation for free. But the doctor also has a special talent. We can pay the doctor here to improve each of our special stats, except for charisma and luck. But she can only do each one once. However, each upgrade is pretty expensive. Strength is 2,000 caps, Perception 4,000, Endurance 3,000, Agility 5,000, and Intelligence 6,000. However, if we're playing a low intelligence character with less than 4 intelligence, she gives us a 50% discount, so it'll cost us only 3,000. Behind her are two lockers. The one to the right is empty, but the one to the left is filled with cams, and we can take as many of these as we wish. That's about everything for floor number two, so heading back to the elevator, we can head to floor number three. We find a large rectangular room as soon as we leave the elevator. Opening the door, we arrive in an entryway. This appears to be the library. There are two paladins guarding the door outside, and heading inside, we see scribes hard at work at their terminals. The two scribes in charge of the library stand at the northern end of this room. The one on the right is Scribe Sophia, and she is Head Scribe Vree's assistant. She tells us that here in the library, they keep records of all technical data on weaponry, technology, and of course, the history of the Brotherhood of Steel. When we ask her about the weapons the Brotherhood makes, she refers us to talk with Head Scribe Vree standing right next to her. But before we go, we can ask her what she does. She says that she focuses on keeping the history of the Brotherhood of Steel. When we ask her to tell us this history, she hands us a holotape. Downloading the data to our Pip-Boy, we can open up the data section to read Sophia's tape. Here we find a two-part history of the Brotherhood of Steel. The exodus from the accursed base was a trying time for the men and their families. While there was no radioactive fallout to contend with, they were frequently beset by the fallout of humanity. Roving bands of psychotic marauders attempted several attacks on that noble group. The company itself was in no danger, for they wore the armor of power. But members of their families were not so lucky. Once the vermin found out that they were easily repelled, they began to fire on the unarmed civilians from a distance. They took a great many casualties. Yet for every member of the Exodus that was struck down in this way, our noble brethren took two lives from the wasteland. Finally, the forefathers came to the safety of the bunker. Captain Maxon, the Great Deliverer, decreed this to be our new home, and all was well. In the fullness of time, the bunker became our home, our temple, and our salvation from the terrors of the outside world. We began to build and shape our fortress into something glorious, the beauty of which the technologically bereft world had never seen before. Yet, there were those who sought still more. These restless souls demanded we look to the southeast for the advanced technology that was supposedly housed there. Captain Maxon warned these impetus youths that the research facility was doubtlessly destroyed when we were spared, but they would not hear his words. They took their sanctified armor and headed off to find their holy grail. 
but not before they spoke the Deliverer's name in vain, questioning his very bravery. These men were never heard from again. Advanced technology at a pre-war research facility? This can be none other than the West Tech Research Facility. The GLOW, the very place the Brotherhood sent us to retrieve a Brotherhood artifact. And with that, the pieces click together. This holotape is recounting the story of how the artifact got lost. The Brotherhood of Steel was founded by an exodus of people led by a man named Captain Maxon. They left what Sophia describes as an accursed base, wherever that may be, but they settled here at Lost Hills. But then a splinter faction within the Brotherhood decided to head to the West Tech Research Facility to search for technology. Captain Maxon tried to warn them against doing so, but they wouldn't listen, and so they left Lost Hills, traveled all the way to the Glow, whereupon they died, and we found their bodies. It was none other than Sergeant Dennis Allen, and the soldiers he brought with him Soto, Camarillo, and Jensen. They all died at the Globe, but the Brotherhood here never knew what happened to them. All they knew is that they disappeared, which is why they sent us to the Globe to retrieve any trace of their fallen brethren. But Allen ended his log by signing Sergeant Dennis Allen, United States Military. If in the early years, immediately after the apocalypse, a member of what became the Brotherhood of Steel was referring to himself as a United States military soldier, could it be that the Brotherhood of Steel itself was founded by post-war remnants of the United States military? Perhaps that could explain why he held the military rank of sergeant, and Maxon here is referred to as Captain Maxon. After reading Sophia's tape, we can talk with Sophia again. She explains why she focuses on the history of the Brotherhood of Steel. Vree is focused on researching weaponry, and she's also trying to understand the biology of supermutants. Vree thinks that those two tasks are more important than the history of the Brotherhood. But Sophia here believes that their history is a vital part of their lives. And she's heartbroken that so many initiates don't understand who Roger Maxon was or exactly what he did for them. Roger Maxon must be the full name of Captain Maxon, referenced in Sophia's holotape. We'll find Vree sometimes standing next to Sophia, and sometimes tinkering with one of the terminals. Greetings. It's a fine day for learning. Can I help you? I know that you're the Master Scribe, but what does that mean? I record the knowledge of our ancestors for future generations. Interesting. That means you know stuff. Yes, I guess you could say I know stuff. I'd like to know more about the weapons we make here. Speak to the knights. Ask them to show you one of the latest laser pistols I designed. We can talk with Vri about how to read a hollow disc. She gives us a crash course, though it's pretty late in the game to be receiving this course. We've already read so many hollow discs by now. Use your Pip-Boy 2000 to read the discs. Insert the disc into the reader. If you have the proper computer skills, you should be able to scan the data. Where can I learn the computer skills? The Brotherhood has some automated courses that you can take. Here, I'll show you. With that, she walks over to a nearby terminal and says, use this terminal to learn the basics of computer operations. If we access the terminal, the screen goes black, and we learn that the lesson finishes in six hours. We feel exhausted. This training permanently increases our science skill by 15 points, or 30 if we tagged it when creating our character. When done, there are a few more things we can ask Vri. We can say, how do I prevent radiation poisoning? Again, a strange game mechanic to introduce us to considering we had to go through the glow, the only highly irradiated place in the game, to even get here. You would need some anti-radiation drugs. I have some. Take these immediately if you think you're near radiation. And finally, we can ask her, what's causing all of the mutants? Between the nuclear and biogenic weapons used in the war, it's surprising we don't have more mutations. However, if we can hold out, everything will be okay. Why do you say that? All the mutants I've studied have been sterile. They can't breed with another creature. If we could clean up the mutation sources, we should be able to simply outlive the mutants. That's an interesting theory. It's one I've heard before, but do you have any proof? Here, take this holodisc. It's got copies of my autopsies on mutant corpses. It clearly shows that no mutant could possibly reproduce successfully. Zack speculated that mutants couldn't reproduce, but he had no proof, and he was careful to tell us that. 
Perhaps Vray's holodisc here is the proof we need. After downloading the information to our Pip-Boy, we can read Vray's experiment tape. Initial observations. This is truly amazing. Some of the knights on a patrolling expedition came across an unusual creature. This creature appears to be humanoid, and quite possibly was once of a human state. However, there are many differences in the structure of this creature than that of normal humans. In the initial investigation of this creature, I discovered that it had a cellular structure akin to that of humans. Before any possible decomposition can take place, I am jotting down the statistics of this subject. Statistics of Subject A. Height, 3.2 meters. Mass, 363.21 kilograms. Gender, indeterminate. Really? Have super mutants lost their bells and whistles? Skin color, predominantly gray with tints of green under the current lighting system. Uncertain if this is due to decay or exposure in the wastelands. Note, the skin is extremely tough with respect to scalpels. Mass breakdown. Muscle mass, 77.41%. Bone mass, 10.23%. Fat mass, 3.2%. And other tissue mass, 9.34%. Cellular structure. Cells undergo cellular division at an increased rate. Mitosis occurs at a rate of 15% quicker than that of normal humans. Cellular structure appears to be highly similar to humans. Genetic structure shows a strong correlation between the subject and Homo sapiens. It's possible that this is a mutation from the nuclear and biochemical agents remnant from the war. DNA strands appear to be very complete. All recessive genes for ailments appear to have been eradicated from the system. The RNA strands also appear to have been manipulated to allow for a greater transmission of signals. Initial hypothesis. Based on the increased size of the neural transmitters and synaptic receivers, I would hypothesize the subject had acute reflexes and heightened senses. Based on the reports the Knights gave of the area in which the subject was discovered, barren, high radiation, extremely high concentrations of chemical agents, it's a wonder the subject survived as long as it did, performing tests to determine possible cause of death. Results of tests conducted upon Subject A. Visual Inspection Black powder burns near the area suggest possible bullet. 1.2 centimeter lacerations upon the calf of the right leg appear to have been made by teeth. We'll conduct test for possible rabies. Skin dried out and flaking. Possible exposure. Oh, wait a minute. Someone shot this mutant and it was bitten in the calf? What, by a dog? Could we have killed this guy? Test results. Radiation count, 12 rads. Rabies test, clean. Hydrochloric gas, clean. Chlorine level, 0.07%. Sulfuric content, 0.02%. Phase shifting virus, clean. Gamma cyclotronic virus, clean. Forced evolutionary virus, 2. Severe overdose. Forced evolutionary virus, 2? Could the first forced evolutionary virus in her mind be the pan-immunity virion project? Hypothesis. Based on my observations, I would hypothesize that the test subject has been killed in a severe fight of at least two people and three animals the size of dogs. Oh, okay, well, maybe it wasn't done by us. What is truly astonishing is the extent of viral infection in the subject. I had read once that some pre-war scientists were conducting experiments with such a virus, but all of the research notes were destroyed. Research into this virus has led to many interesting discoveries. The test subject has gained many of its mutations from the overdose of the virus. This would account for the enhanced muscle and bone structure. Additionally, the recessive genes which are commonly found in humans have been manipulated in such a way as to bring about the best possible combination. While the process by which this happens is uncertain, it does have some severe side effects. Chief among them is sterility. The test subject would have been unable to reproduce with any creature, whether clean or mutated. I wonder why that is. Was he shooting blanks? Other side effects include an alteration of pigment of the epidermis. The life expectancy is increased by 10%. Intellect is decreased by this strain by 30%. Conclusions. Based on this information, I extrapolate that we could simply outlive these mutants. However, based on the fact that these mutants have a super high concentration of the virus, it stands to reason that there could be some place which is creating them. As to where they could be, I cannot hazard a guess.
This is a fascinating discovery. It gives us the evidence we need to conclude that supermutants are indeed sterile. However, Vree's conclusion here is inaccurate because she doesn't have the information we got inside the glow. We learned from Zax that subjects infected with FEV are immortal. They can't die due to cell death, therefore they could never die of old age or by natural causes. They're immune to cancers, for example. So she's wrong. Humanity simply can't outlive the supermutants. Once they're made, they have to be killed. But she is right in suggesting that if they are sterile and they can't reproduce, then they are being manufactured. And we've got a good idea who's doing it. But sadly, she doesn't know where. And that information was the sole reason we came here. Perhaps we can learn more by further exploring this bunker. Heading out of the library and moving east, we can enter the southernmost door to the east. Inside, we find a couple of soldiers behind some work tables. We'll talk to the guy manning the table to the right. He says, ah, so you are the new initiate. Welcome aboard. What can I do for you? When we ask him what he's up to, we learn that his name is Paul. He's the head of energy weapons development. That includes laser and plasma weapons. You name it, he's built it or repaired it. If we ask him if we can get our hands on an energy weapon, he says that we have to check in with Michael on floor one to be issued a weapon. But first, we have to get authorization by talking with Talus. Well, in lieu of being gifted one, we can ask him if we can see one of the new laser pistols. And he says, sure, this is the latest in handheld laser technology. He takes a small pistol from his work table and hands it to us. This is the very same laser weapon that Vri was bragging about. She designed it. As we admire the craftsmanship, we ask him if we can keep it, but he says that the one we are holding won't do us much good. It's still lacking the lenses and the amplifier. He then takes it back and puts it on the work table. In order to get one, we've really got to go to Michael and Talus. When we ask him what kind of damage it'll do to a person, he says that in the hands of a skilled warrior, it could cut a person in half. The beam will shear flesh faster than you can run your finger through sand. Next, we'll move over to the northern table. This table appears to have some sort of armor on it. But the man behind the counter seems to have some sort of attitude. He says, ah, so you're the one, huh? When we ask him what he means by that, he says, nothing. It's just that no one has ever made it back from the ancient order before. When we ask him if that's true, then why would they send us to such a place? He laughs and he says, I guess they just wanted to get rid of you, huh? Well, the joke's on them. We can come clean with the guy and say, look, the only reason I wanted to join the Brotherhood was because the guy outside was bragging about the T-51B suit of power armor, and I want to get my hands on some of that. He says, well, I'd give you some of this armor right here, but it's missing its systolic motivator, and it's useless without it. When we ask him how we can repair the thing, he says that the Brotherhood has replacement motivators in the supply room. But Michael is a bit of a pen pusher, and he says that this particular suit of armor isn't up to specs. And because of that, he refuses to have it repaired and issued to the troops. But by not up to specs, he simply means that the eyepiece had to be resoldered into place. It works perfectly fine, but it just doesn't look quite as pretty as it needs to for inspection. So it's not a legitimate reason for refusing to repair the suit. Well, since it sounds like no one wants such a faulty piece of equipment, we can say, look, if I brought you a systolic motivator, would you fix this suit for me? And he says, whoa, now hold on a minute there, fella. That would take a good couple of hours. I'd loan you a manual and my tools, but you're going to have to repair this thing yourself. We can ask, well, if I can't get a motivator from Michael, where can I get a spare motivator to repair this suit? He responds by saying that Paladin Rhombus may have a couple of them. We shouldn't ask him for one. In his mind, only the, quote, honored are supposed to wear these here power suits. Besides, he says, lowering his voice, I think Rhombus has an unnatural attachment to them. So, here we have a beautiful suit of power armor, but we can't wear it because it's missing a systolic motivator. Well, looks like we need to go upstairs to talk with Michael to see if we can get one. But first, let's finish exploring this floor, heading out of the workshop, and moving north up the hallway, we can turn right to enter the barracks. These are the rooms of the scribes. And like the rooms for the initiates, these guys don't like us snooping around. They ask us to leave, but there are no consequences. We can even loot the containers where we find super stim packs, grenades, and even some weapons. 
When done, we can head back to the elevator and take it to floor one. Heading east down the hallway, we can check in with Michael. When we tell him that we're looking for a systolic motivator, he asks us for the proper authorization. Now, our only way to get the part is if we bluff our way through this conversation. If we're honest with him and we say, no, we don't have authorization, or if we mention Kyle's name at all, he refuses to help us. In fact, if we mention Kyle's name, he says, Kyle, is this about that old junked power armor? And if we say yes, he says you can tell him that when he gets that unit back to its original glory, then and only then will he get the authorization he needs. Goodbye. Wow. All this over a badly soldered eyepiece? He then refuses to talk with us about it again. If we go back to Kyle and say that Michael refused to give us one because we told him that Kyle sent us, he mocks us and says, Well, of course he denied you. And here I thought you were smart. I told you that the guy had official forms for brains. This leaves only one option, and that's to get one from Rhombus. But this is extremely tricky. Heading to Rhombus's room, we find him standing right next to the door. And if we try to walk near it, he takes us aside. All right. Explain yourself, initiate. Oh, uh, I just got lost. Then leave, and I will forget this little incident. And we get teleported outside his door. The best way to do this is to wait until midnight. At midnight, he opens the back door and walks to his bedroom. But even if we have a really high sneak skill, and even if we use a stealth boy, he hears us if we open his door. He says, who's there? And we don't have enough time to make it to his locker to loot the motivator and race out. Now, there is a way to go about this, but it kind of exploits the combat system. If we wait until midnight when he's asleep, walk into his room, and then initiate combat, that freezes all NPCs who are not hostile, and we can move around only consuming our AP. In this way, we can walk to the locker without alerting him, loot the motivator, and make our escape. Though I admit that is a bit hacky and kind of feels like cheating. Alternatively, when talking with Michael, we could bluff our way through by saying, Yes, I do have the authorization. I was sent here to get the systolic motivator. He then checks his terminal to see if we have the authorization, and he says, Well, wait a minute, I don't see a request here for the systolic motivator. All of these responses cause us to fail, except the one where we say, You don't have the authorization? Ordnance was supposed to send one down yesterday. Look, can you help me out? If I don't get this part, it's gonna be my butt. I'm sure the form will be there later today. And if we have high enough charisma, he'll say, All right, here you go. Just don't tell anyone that I gave this to you. Rhombus would have my head if he knew that I had given the parts out without proper authorization. We thank him, and we can head on our way. With the part in hand, we can head back down to floor three and pass it over to Kyle. He says, great, here, let me just install this in the unit. After a brief period of time, he says, okay, you're all set to go. Take this manual. If you have any kind of aptitude with repairing things, you should have no problem. Good luck. He gives us a copy of Dean's Electronics, and we now have to use our repair skill to repair the suit of armor. We need at least a 75% repair skill to fix the armor. If we don't have it, we have to either use a tool to boost our repair skill, or keep trying and hoping we get lucky. If we succeed, we earn 500 experience points, and the fully assembled suit of armor appears on the ground before us. By selecting it, we loot a suit of T-51 power armor. At last, we finally have power armor, and this armor is so much better than the combat armor. This boosts our armor class from 28 to 33. It nearly doubles all of our resistances, more than doubling some of them like explosives, and it improves our strength by plus three, which greatly increases our unarmed damage. We now almost have our end game armor. There is still one suit that's better. We'll get to it a bit later. On floor four, we can open a door to the east, and here we find two paladins guarding a door. One says, Rhombus is my idol. The other says, you should talk with Talus or Maxon if you have any questions. Heading through the door, we find two figures. One is wearing power armor and the other wearing a long robe. Talking to the one in power armor, we learn that this is Paladin Mathia. Hello, Initiate, says Mathia. So, you're the one who made it out of the ancient order alive. 
The name is Mathia. I am officially Maxon's assistant, but I'm also here to make sure nobody messes with the old man. Old man, we can say that sounds a bit disrespectful. But Mathia clarifies and says, no, no, not at all. He is a good guy. Besides, I wouldn't badmouth him while he's standing right next to me. He then goes on to explain exactly what he does. Mathia takes care of all of the paperwork. Maxon couldn't do paperwork to save his life. He also processes weapon orders that Maxon has cleared. So it sounds like if we get any weapons from Maxon, we've got to talk with Mathia. Next, we'll talk with the robed figure, High Elder Maxon. Uh, hello, youngster. Cabot said you wanted to talk. Look, I'm, uh, I'm pretty stacked up right now, so I'll, uh, I'll help you out as long as you don't start flapping your gums too much. You know, outsiders are like that, always jawing. <laughs> Gotta like me, huh? You know, Maxon, everyone here seems to be on edge. It's kind of like you're getting ready to go to war, but no one knows with who. Can you tell me about that? Well, the merchants from the hub told us a bunch of caravans disappeared on their way up north. I think there's an army in the mountains. But the elders, well, uh, they don't want to act until they're sure. If we found the mutant transmission's holotape on the corpse of the mutant in the Deathclaw Cave, we can hand this to Maxon and say, I have found proof. It is this army that is causing the disappearances of the caravans. It's an army of mutants. You have good reason to be worried. They look formidable. Then you understand the problem. To survive, we need someone who knows the outside. Like you. We can offer to help in three ways. We can say, I'll go scout out the area to the north, then report what I find. Good. Anything else you need to ask? Or we can ask for caps, and if we ask for a thousand... Pretty interesting set of priorities and loyalties you got there. You know what, Maxon? Take it or leave it. I'll take it. We need the information to save lives. Sounds like a plan, Maxon. Look... Would it be possible for me to get a hold of some better supplies? Well, I suggest you talk to my assistant, Mathia, about that. With that, Maxon agrees to give us some weapons. Heading over to Mathia, Mathia says Maxon has cleared a weapons upgrade for you. We can choose between a sniper rifle, a rocket launcher, a laser pistol, a power fist, or a ripper. I honestly don't need any of this for my character. The rocket launcher is pretty rare. But so is the Power Fist. I eventually chose the Rocket Launcher, but if I could do it over again, I would have chosen the Power Fist because a companion may be able to use this a bit later. Heading back to Maxon, we can see if he'll talk with us anymore. We can say, what can you tell me about Brotherhood history? Look, I don't have time for a story that long right now. Here, all of us grew up on this. Okay, fine. You just appear to be standing here in this room, but hey, I'll take your word on it. He gives us a holotape. We'll read this after we finish our conversation. We can then ask him, what is the Brotherhood's main purpose? Our main goal is to survive. The scribes copy old plans for weapons or design new ones, and the knights make guns from them. Most guns come from us. Who are the elders? Well, you see, there's four of them. And that's about all they can ever agree on. They can't even agree if they want to piss. Much less pick a pot to piss in. What can you tell me about a Deathclaw? Oh, just another stupid rumor. Some people say it's a huge fanged monster, and others say it's a vampire. All right, that's everything, Maxon. Then get out. I have work to do. Taking a look at the holotape he gave us, we can read Maxon's log. This is the history he says that the Brotherhood of Steel grew up on. By my orders, as active commanding officer following the untimely death of Colonel Robert Spindle during this time of crisis, the full base security team has been deployed to the security bunker at Lost Hills. This directive also includes the families of the officers and enlisted men. Unless otherwise directed from a proper representative of the War Department, this order will stand as written. Operative 1. All military personnel and their families are to vacate the base by 0800 on the 25th of October, 2077. All personnel traveling under the command will make their way to Lost Hills Base. No leave has been granted. Operative 2. All civilian personnel are directed to remain at base, pending orders from their legal command structure. Operative 3, equipment deemed unnecessary to the survival of base military personnel is to be immediately drawn from stores. Proper authorization will follow, time permitting. 
Operative 4, all codes of military justice will be harshly enforced on military personnel and civilian personnel in joint military operations. Operative 5, until such a time as consistent and authorized communication can be established with the War Department, these orders will have precedence over any previously established orders. Captain Maxson, October 24th, 2077. Holy cow! This log entry was written by Captain Maxson one day after the bombs dropped on October 23rd, 2077. And just before the mass exodus we read about in the history we got from Scribe Sophia, Captain Maxson served Colonel Robert Spindle, who must have died when the bombs dropped. They were manning some sort of base. But a day after the bombs dropped, he took over for Colonel Spindle and essentially assumed control of the forces stationed at that base, giving the soldiers new orders, which overwrote any orders they had previously received. He then led all military personnel and their families from the base where they were stationed here to the Lost Hill Bunker. But he left all the civilians at that base. He seems to have been operating under the assumption that the world had not ended yet, that the United States government still existed. Which I suppose is understandable since he wrote this only a day after the bombs dropped. I think this is clear evidence that the Brotherhood of Steel was created by the remnants of the United States military that survived the nuclear apocalypse led by Captain Roger Maxson. Now, Captain Roger Maxson and John Maxson, the man we are talking to now, are related, but him being in a role of leadership isn't nepotism. We learn that he had to be talked into becoming the High Elder when we ask him what the role of an Elder is. <laughs> a fine, handsome, upstanding man. The High Elder position is to mediate meetings between the Elders. See, two years ago I got talked into it. If I'd have known then... And when we ask him about the Great Exodus that we learned about in Vree's holotape, we learned that the original Roger Maxson was not John's father, but his grandfather. Well, that was when my granddad, Roger Maxson, led his soldiers here and started the Brotherhood. He never mentioned where they came from, but it doesn't really matter because, well, this is our home now. Roger Maxson, huh? Well, he led our people here in the Great Exodus. Started the Brotherhood from scratch, quite a leader. We learn that John Maxson here actually misses his days as a paladin. Paladins are in charge of all security and outside activities. I remember trading with the Hub, going on scouting missions for the Elders. Ah man, those were good times. And we get to hear a bit of a scandal between the Brotherhood of Steel and the Water Merchants. You want to hear about the Water Merchants? <laughs> well, you cannot trust them. A few years ago, they offered us water for a huge stockpile of weapons. Well, we told them no. You know what they did? They sent in thieves to steal the weapons. We caught them. But the elders voted down going to the hub to teach the merchants a lesson. I think that was a damn mistake. This whole Brotherhood Exodus thing is fascinating, and it has biblical undertones. An apocalypse happens, and they leave some sort of base to go on an exodus. But before they do, their leader, Roger Maxson, jots down five operatives, similar to the Ten Commandments. After talking with Maxson, we have free reign of the officers' quarters here. We can explore each of these rooms, and none of the doors are locked, but few of the lockers have anything of note. There is an interesting looking mainframe computer in the back here, but we can't talk with it like we could with Zax. And using our science skill, we don't learn anything, though our perception tells us that it's probably the fastest looking computer we've ever seen. Maybe it's all that chrome. When we're done exploring the officer's quarters, we can head up the hallway past Maxon's door to the northwest. At the end, we find a door that leads to... Eh, what is this? A bit of a meeting room or chapel? We see a pulpit on a stage. We see two guards guarding this northern door, but we can open it and enter the room freely. But as soon as we do, we're taken aside by one of the four Brotherhood elders. Greetings, Initiate, says one. I need to speak with you, and he motions for us to come closer. What is it we can say? He says that there's an urgent matter that he needs our help with. 
It's Maxon. We're pretty sure he's gone off the deep end. He keeps babbling about an army massing to the north. I'm not willing to send our troops up there into possibly irradiated areas unless I've got absolute proof that this army exists. I need someone who isn't a friend of the old man. Someone I can get an honest report from. Are you willing to check the northern region? So the elders want us to do exactly the same thing that Maxon wants us to do, but for different reasons. Maxon wants us to prove that he's right, the elders want us to prove that he's wrong. Once we agree, he says that if we find anything, we need to come back and talk with the elders here. Then they'll decide what they'll do with High Elder Maxon. So Maxon does not wield absolute authority. Sounds like he can be deposed from power at any time by the Council of Elders. Well, we have a whole lot to do. We'll start by seeing if we can find the missing Brotherhood Initiate at the Hub. And thinking back, there was one spot that we didn't fully explore. Remember in Old Town, as we were about to leave, we passed one building, but when we entered through the door, we were immediately attacked by thugs inside. We are much better equipped now, so heading back to Old Town, we can pass through the door. And sure enough, even though we're in a full suit of power armor, these thugs attack. But now, we can make quick and easy work of them. When the thugs are dead, we can open a door in the back of the room where we find a kidnapped Brotherhood Initiate. Thank you, stranger, says the Initiate. I don't know how many weeks, perhaps months, those thugs have had me here. I'm very grateful for your help, and I'm sure the Brotherhood of Steel is also. But we can tell him, I'm from the Brotherhood, and I've been looking for you. But then he calls us a liar. Don't you think I know every member of our order? But we have to tell him that he wouldn't know us because we just joined. And then to convince him that we're telling the truth, we drop some names. We can say that Talus sent us. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. Well, you must have passed that test the elders made up. I completely forgot about that. He then goes on to talk about how impressed he is that we found him. After all, the wasteland is a big place. We could be smug about it and say, well, you know, I'm just that good. Or we could be a bit more humble and say, hey, actually, tell us told me where you went. Either way, he thanks us and then says, if we head back to Lost Hills, he is sure the Brotherhood will reward us. Back at Lost Hills, we can go to the first floor and talk with Talus in the training room. And he says, Brother Oxhorn, I've received word from Brother Jonathan. Thank you for rescuing him. As your reward, you can have your choice of one of the following. And he gives us an option between a rocket launcher, a laser pistol, a super sledgehammer, or some power armor. Well, the power armor is clearly the most valuable item that he offers us. This is another way to walk away with a suit of power armor from the Brotherhood of Steel. So even if we have low repair skill and we can't repair the suit down on level 3, we always have the option to find Lost Initiate Jonathan. To get the power armor, we head up to Michael. He says, yes, you do have authorization to check something out. Powered armor. Be sure to take care of it. I can't give out more than one set. But the suit of power armor is exactly the same in terms of specs as the suit we repaired on level 3, even if the lens is soldered on a bit crooked. And with that, we have fully explored the Brotherhood of Steel here at the Lost Hills Bunker. But sadly, we didn't walk away with the information we wanted. We knew that we had to go to the Mariposa military base, but the Brotherhood didn't know where it was. In our next video, we'll continue to explore the wasteland in search of the location of the Mariposa military base. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel, and if you want to make sure you don't miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They also come in other products as well, like smartphone cases, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with the next video in the full story of Fallout 1.